Praise the Lord. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to part two of Zero to Sixty. It's wonderful to have you with us. Grab your Bibles and turn to John chapter 14. As you do, I want to say hello to our church family, meaning and other campuses, those of you who are joining us online, all the correctional facilities, everybody in additional seating. Come on, church, let's put our hands together one more time and welcome our church family. It's great to have you with us. Man, what a week it has been. We joined together as humanity in our nerd glasses to stare at the sun on Monday. Everybody enjoy the eclipse. You have a good, good time watching the thing. Just, that was, it was pretty cool. Uh, you know, our kids are working overtime to try and get little thunder, our five-year-old, not to go blind and tell it, like, you can't look at the sun, bro. You can't do it. And uh, for those of you that are uh, raising children and they're all ages five and under, the S word at your house is probably stupid, but at our house, we have teenagers. So the S word is the actual S word. And we say stupid because that's just a normal part of our language. And I guess at some point during the whole eclipse proceedings, somebody looked at thunder was like, don't be stupid. You gotta wear your glasses, you're gonna go blind. Because then the next day I picked him up from Connect, the daycare that we have here at the church. And I asked him, I was like, buddy, did you have a good day? He was like, no, I got in trouble. I was like, you got in trouble, what'd you do? And he was like, I said a bad word. And I was like, you said a bad word, what'd you, what'd you, what'd you say? And he said, my friend was looking up at the sun, so I said, what the heck, don't be stupid. I was like, Thunder, we don't say what the heck or stupid. He was like, I know, I know. So apparently at the school now, everybody's saying what the heck. And so if your child's saying what the heck, we apologize from the Sumrall family. That's definitely our fault. And if they start saying stupid, you know where it came from because Thunder was trying to keep his friend from going blind at recess and got a little passionate, a little over the top. So praise the Lord. <laughs> Great times. I love this series because I love cars. If you don't know much about me, I, I, I was born Ricky Bobby. I want to go fast. Praise the Lord. I'm always Googling zero to 60 times, which is where the whole title of the series came from. And as we began to study it out years ago, when we started the series, we found that cars are deeply spiritual. There's a lot of spiritual parallels. In fact, uh, it's really actually how t Jesus taught so many times in his earthly ministry, he'd take things from everyday life and pull out the spiritual principles. And so that's what we like to do during this series. And if you've never been with us before, we've had Italian cars, we've had all kinds of German cars, we've had European cars. This year we decided we would go all American. So praise God for America, American muscle. If you missed last weekend, we had a 67 Chevrolet Camaro SS, which was the very first year the Camaro was ever built. And it was built for one purpose, to beat the Mustang. And you are made for one purpose, and that's to show the life and the love of Jesus to every single person that you meet. If you missed last weekend, you need to jump online and check it out. Today, we have a beautiful 2023 Dodge Challenger Hellcat jailbreak. And we will tell you all about what that means. But this car has 717 horsepower. It is powered by a supercharged 6.2 liter V8 Hemi engine. Praise the Lord, which is why it sounds so good. Probably the best, in my opinion, the best sounding of all of the American sports cars. And it does zero to 60, depending on who's driving, and anywhere from 3.9, 3.8 seconds, all the way up to 5.3, because some of you just like to slide around and don't know how to use the throttle. And there's more power that this car has than really is able to be harnessed because that's just how cool it is. The Challenger is actually part of American muscle history. Uh, we talked last weekend about how uh, Chrysler actually got into the game earlier than Ford with the Barracuda, released in 1964, just a little bit before the Mustang, when they created what we call now the Pony Cars, which is a subdivision of the muscle cars. And uh, the thing that's fascinating is all the Chrysler fans who love the Barracuda wanted them to be called fish cars. So praise the Lord that they didn't win, right? That would have been weird calling them fish cars. So I like pony cars better. But they didn't have a ton of success with the Barracuda. So Mopar, which stands for more parts, it's the bigger parent company of Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram. They decided to move over to their Dodge division and launch 
the challenger back in the early 70s. Now, we talked about how Camaro was late to the game. Dodge was super late to the game. So in 1964, the Mustang was released. It wasn't until 1970 that the Challenger was able to be purchased. It was a little bit bigger than the Barracuda, but a little bit smaller than the Charger. And the Charger is now built in a four-door version, but back then it was just a two-door. And that was the Dukes of Hazard car, the General Lee. Can I get an amen in God's house for the orange? General Lee grew up wanting to jump my car off of something until I read one day that they took them 300 cars to film that show because every time they went over a jump, they had to burn the car because it bent the frame and the chassis and like it'd never run, run again. So apparently that's not a thing you can ever do on TV only. Uh, but when they launched this Challenger in 1970, you could get it with a 425 horsepower 426 Hemi engine, which is absolutely amazing, especially for that time and a four-speed manual. And uh, unfortunately... Because there was an oil crisis impending and all kinds of EPA restrictions coming, the early 70s was the death of the pony car, muscle car war anyway, and things began to dry up. So the car was only built from 1970 to 1973, and then they revived it for five years from 1978 to 1983, but it was fairly unsuccessful again. But then in 2008, something wonderful happened in America. A revival of muscle cars and people start, started to really crave those high horsepower engines again and Ford was going through this retro uh, modern muscle car remake of their car which kind of inspired all the other car manufacturers and that's when the Challenger was reborn and they made it from 2008 until 2023 and everybody celebrated the Challenger because it really was the closest to the original 1970s car of all three major manufacturers, which of course is Ford with the Mustang and Chevrolet with the Camaro, and then Dodge with the Challenger. And now of course the Charger is out again in a four-door model. But it's fascinating to see how they took kind of that retro look and feel and they've maintained it pretty consistently for all the years that they've made it until 2023, which this is one. Some of you are thinking like, how could you ever put a car called a Hellcat on stage? That seems so sacrilegious, it's a Hellcat. Well, hell is where cats are going, so that fits. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, it works. It's prophetic. <laughs> uh, just had to do it, I'm sorry. The Hellcat engine line actually didn't appear until 2015, and they were big supercharged V8s, which we'll get into what that means in just a minute. But uh, it's actually fascinating how a lot of these car manufacturers and, and uh, engines were all named after World War II airplanes. The country in the early 70s, of course, had come out of World War II, and so the Mustang was a plane that was incredibly effective in World War II. And the Dodge Hellcat is actually named after a World War II plane called the Grumman F6F Hellcat Fighter. And it was designed to specifically do battle with the Mitsubishi Zero in the Pacific Theater. But the thing that's interesting is that the Hellcat was uh, heavily armed, high powered, and well protected. But even though it was heavier and bigger than the Mitsubishi, it actually was uh, more nimble and it was a better fighting instrument. And so Dodge kind of took that thought and they infused it into their cars and the vehicles, both the Charger and the Challenger that have the Hellcat engines are much heavier and much bigger than their counterpart rivals, but they're far more powerful. And so typically they are also faster. And so that's kind of where all that came from. Now the knock against Dodge if you're a person that loves to track your car and, and drive around corners really fast is that the Dodge really doesn't handle. And Dodge really didn't care. They don't care that you don't have control of the car. Their only goal is that you are a drag race winner, that you go as fast as you can from zero to 60. And uh, I think that's a pretty good mission in life. I feel like that's probably the right target that we should be shooting at. And so we're gonna celebrate the fact that they figured that out. Now this is the jailbreak edition and the thing that's interesting and unique about that is that for some reason, uh, you know, the, the whole industry of cars is going in a direction that is uh, unbiblical and unspiritual. 
and we have to pray for them. But both Camaro and both Chevy and, uh, and Dodge are discontinuing their muscle cars in 23 and 24. So this is the final year. 2023 is the final year. And then they're going to give us something electric next year that has speakers that make car sounds. And they think we're going to be excited about that. And I just don't think they did their research. And I'm not against EVs. I think that's great. All of you with Teslas and your EV cars, we celebrate you. Good job. It's fantastic. Just don't take our cars away. Just please let me have mine. So anyway, not the point. So here's what Dodge did. They had several years where you could get a Hellcat or a Hellcat Red Eye, and it came with very specific limitations because they were very brand conscious. And then once you drive around with a yellow car and purple stripes and red logos and all kinds of nonsense because they knew that you would mess it up. They knew that I would make ugly cars. And so what they decided to do in 22 and 23, the jailbreak stands for we've broken you out of any kind of jail we would have made and you can select any color combination. You can get any brake caliper color within a range. You can get any wheels that you want. You can put any stripes on it you want. The Hellcat emblem can come any color that you want. There's all kinds of options that are available on these cars that never were available before. So if you want to make the grossest Dodge that you can ever think of, Dodge wanted to empower you to do that in the final couple of years of manufacturing. And of course, Lance did the righteous thing and he chose black on black, which is the best color a car could ever be. Can I get an amen in God's house from the purists? That's pretty bad. We're going to have to set you free from wanting color on your car. And so the jailbreak cars had a couple of features like the fact you get it in any color, but then they actually tune them differently. And so the Hellcats didn't come with the typical 707 horsepower. They came with 717. And then the red eyes didn't come with 797. They came with 807. So there's a couple changes there in the engine. But the thing that's fascinating to me is the amount of fuel these things drink. I mean, if you're a pro EV person, you're really going to hate these cars because it actually has such a big fuel pump that it can pump 510 pounds of fuel per hour. To put that in perspective, that means it's 1.36 gallons per minute. And to put that in perspective, your shower head gives you water at about two gallons per minute. So when you're driving this car, you're basically taking a shower in gas. So I think the gas pedal and the fuel is connected directly. Like as you speed up, it just like by the time I get to the light, I'll be out of gas. I think that's pretty much kind of how it works. But, uh, but one of the things that makes all the Hellcats unique and what I want to focus on for a few minutes today is this propulsion system called a supercharger. So superchargers and turbochargers have been around for a long time. The difference is a turbocharger takes exhaust air and it puts it back into the engine a supercharger takes an air compressor and heats up the air and compresses it and then it goes through a cooler which puts the oxygen back in it which is the whole point and it fires it into the engine because the more air an engine can have the faster and more powerful it can be so a lot of manufacturers have gone to turbochargers and superchargers and much smaller engines so they could get greater horsepower out of a smaller application Dodge did the godly thing and they took the biggest engine they could find. Then they put a massive supercharger on top of that to just make a ridiculous engine. It's a 2.4 liter supercharger. And if you get the red eye, it comes with a 2.7 liter supercharger that forces air into the engine that supercharges the performance of the car. And I've known about these things for a long time, but as I was praying through this car and preparing for this series and talking about how we're live, taking this journey spiritually to be where God's called us to be and how we're supposed to be a light in the darkness, and that's the one thing we all have in common, the question is then what empowers us to do that? And the answer is that there is this supercharged version of the Christian life that Jesus always intended for you to live. Ephesians says it this way in chapter 3. We'll get to John in just a minute, I promise. But Ephesians says in verse uh, 20 of chapter 3, Glory belongs to God whose power is at work in us. And because of that power, we could do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. 
infinitely more. Without the supercharger, this car's somewhere in the 400, uh, high 400s, low 500 horsepower. But when you get the supercharger involved, it all of a sudden it jumps to seven, 800 horsepower because of the airflow that comes through the car. Jesus intended for you to have airflow through your Christian life that would empower you to live a life that's beyond anything that you could possibly imagine. Jesus said it this way in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. This is fascinating to me because a supercharger sits upon the top of the engine. And it forces air into the engine that creates this ability to perform beyond its natural capacity. And I want you to know, so too the Holy Spirit is supposed to rest upon our lives in such a way that supernaturally propels us to do exceedingly more than we ever believed possible. In fact, that word power that Jesus used is strength, ability. It speaks of moral power, like to overcome sin. The Holy Spirit helps you live a righteous life. Not only that, but it gives you supernatural power. Jesus said miracles and signs and wonders would follow believers that we'd be able to heal the sick, that we'd be able to cast devils out of people, that we'd be able to see blind eyes open. Those miracles are because of the Holy Spirit. There's a boldness that comes to influence the world. It's why Peter goes, from lying to a little girl and cussing her out next to a fire to preaching the day of Pentecost and telling thousands of people Jesus was crucified by your sin. Now you need to say sorry and repent and and have your sins forgiven. There's no way he could have had that quick of a turnaround with that much boldness without the infusion of something supernatural. The Holy Spirit, I believe, is our supercharger to breathe wind into your sails in life. And I can show it to you from Scripture. Go back to Genesis chapter 1. In the Old Testament, first time the word spirit is used, it says, Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. That word spirit in the Old Testament, the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, is the Hebrew word ruach, and it means a wind, a violent exhalation, or a blast of breath. If you go to the New Testament, Jesus in John chapter 6 and verse 63, he says the Spirit, speaking about the Holy Spirit, the Spirit gives life. That New Testament word, the New Testament's written in Greek, the word pneuma. It means a current of air or a blast of breath, a strong breeze. Every time the word spirit, speaking of the spirit of God or the Holy Spirit in scripture, both Old Testament and New is mentioned. It literally is speaking of the essence of God, the breath of God, the power of God that propels you through life. There's something about the Holy Spirit that changes the atmosphere. It changes your ability. It changes the environment. It's why, for those of you that are new to I-Town and you're kind of kicking the tires and you're saying, you know, there's something just different about this place. I just feel different when I go here versus when I'm just out in the world or I'm in secular places. I come in and I sense there's, there's something lighter about it. I, there's like hope for my life and, and, and I kind of feel maybe a little goosebumps or something during worship. It's kind of weird. Like I've talked to people after church like, man, there's something in there. That's weird. Like, I don't, I felt something, but it was weird. I just want you to know that's the presence of the Holy Spirit. It's the power of God. It's called the anointing. The breath of God breathes on our services. It's the secret sauce, I believe, of I-Town. We call it life giving. Why? Because the Spirit gives life. That's why you know when you've encountered religion, when you feel all condemned and you're like, man, I'll never be as good as the pastor and my life is such a mess and I'll never get this thing turned around and you just feel worse about yourself. You haven't encountered the spirit of God. You've encountered religion. But when you feel like, man, I can hold my head back and I can stand up a little bit straighter and I know that God is for me and not against me and I'm going to have a better week than I had last week. That's the presence of God because the spirit gives 
life. It's the breath of God. And so I believe that the devil has completely attacked this subject because he does not want you to have the power that God has called you to have. He doesn't want to want you to live in boldness. He doesn't want you to know who you are in Christ. He doesn't want you to have gifts. He doesn't want you to have power over the enemy. He doesn't want you to have the confidence to know that no weapon formed against you will prosper. And every time you speak the name of Jesus, the devil must flee. He doesn't want to shudder every time you wake up. He wants you to believe that you were made for less. And it's okay that you're a Christian as long as you don't impact anybody else for the gospel. You can live your poor little miserable existence because you're certainly no light for him. And I believe the way that we live this conquering, overcoming, empowering life is by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I want to show it to you for just a few minutes from Scripture. Because from John 14 through John 16, Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples. And it's one of the very last conversations that he would ever have with them. Very important moment. He's getting ready. In fact, just on the other side of this text, Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and is betrayed. And he goes to the cross and gives his life. So he's kind of debriefing and downloading to his team the culmination of three and a half years of ministry. He's preparing them for this significant moment in these few chapters. And it would take us years to exegetically get through every one of these texts. But what we're going to do is just highlight the moments that Jesus speaks about the Holy Spirit. And I want to show you for just a few minutes what it looks like biblically to live a spirit-empowered life. Verse 16 of John 14, Jesus says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever. There's a lot to that text, but the first thing I want you to write down, number one, to have the Holy Spirit means that you have a helper, a helper. This translation uses the word advocate. Some call him comforter. Other places call him the counselor. He's our intercessor. He's the one who is our friend. He's the one who begins to come alongside us. In fact, perikaletos is the Greek word that Jesus used there that has a lot of depth to the word. The literal translation into English is someone who is summoned or called to one side to bring aid. It's someone who pleads the case before a judge for someone else. That's that word counselor. He's like legal counsel. He's standing before God petitioning our case. And Jesus was that for his disciples. He says, I'm going to give you another advocate. I've been here physically as your advocate, but I'm going to ask that the Father would send another advocate to be with you. The Holy Spirit. He continues in verse 17. The spirit of truth is what the Bible calls him. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. Now I want you to see something theologically for just a minute because I believe this is where we kind of blow it and where there's a lot of division in the body of Christ. So clearly he's there as our perikletos, our helper, our advocate. But we have to understand his role. Jesus said very clearly in this passage, right now, he is with you. Now, the reason why is because Jesus has not yet gone to the cross. He's not yet died for the sins of humanity. There is no salvation to be given because sin has not yet been paid for. So the Holy Spirit is with him. If you want to take some extra notes, I want to show you very quickly three separate experiences with the Holy Spirit. Jesus clearly says that the Holy Spirit is with us before salvation. He says to his disciples, right now, he is with you. In fact, if you go to John chapter 16, you want to put your finger in John 14, turn over to 16, verse 8, Jesus says, when he comes, speaking about the Holy Spirit, here's what he'll do. He'll convict the world of sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. So the Holy Spirit before salvation is with us as the spirit of truth and he's helping to bring clarity to our confusion. Now the reason is because the devil is a liar and he's a very good liar. So everything the devil says has truth mixed with a lie. 
That's the reason why we get deceived. Even in the Garden of Eden, he said, did God really say? And then he said some things that were true along with some things that were false. And all of a sudden, everything gets real murky and muddy. And you're like, well, I know that's true. So maybe this is also true. And it kind of feels right. And so we get into a place of deception. And the problem with deception is that we don't know that we're deceived. That's why it's called deception. So what the devil does in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, the Bible says the God of this age has blinded the minds of people who don't know the Lord. They cannot see the goodness of God. They can't see the light. So it's not that they don't know. I want you to pause for just a minute. Those of you who call yourself believers, if you're not a believer yet, you can take a pause for just a minute. We'll get back to you in a second, all right? If you're a believer, think about the people you know who do not believe in God. They all have reasons why. Well, if God really was all loving, then these things wouldn't happen. Well, I don't really need religion because I'm a good person. And so I'm going to do enough good things. And if God really is loving, then I'll get to heaven. And that's nice. You have that religious crutch and that you go get your Jesus time. You feel better about yourself. That's good for you. It's not for me. You see, there's all these things that blind people's minds. They think it's not for me. They think it's not really real. They think you're delusional. They think you need an emotional crutch because they don't see. It's not that they don't know. Almost all of America knows about Jesus. They know about the Bible. They know of the existence of God. They just don't see. And so that's what we're always praying is that the Holy Spirit, whose job is to convict the world, would help them see sin. If you don't know you're a sinner, then you don't know you need a savior. And so the problem with the world is that they're not recognizing sin for what it is. And that's why the devil works overtime to pervert and distort what truth really is. Because as long as truth can be twisted, then there's no sure foundation. As long as there's no sure foundation, there's no clear right and wrong. If there's no clear right and wrong, then there is no sin. Because your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth. And unfortunately, people confused and what is actually the truth are headed to hell. Because hell will be full of good people with good intentions because there is no such thing. There are people dead in their sins and there are people alive to Christ and there's nothing in between. But the world cannot accept that. They don't see it. So the Holy Spirit's job is to convict them of sin and God's righteousness, that that's broken and that God's way is better. Aren't you thankful that that's the Holy Spirit's job and not our job? And that's honestly one of the places that we blow it. Just sinners and wrong and rah, 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 rah. we just yell, stop, 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 don't, don't, don't. You're horrible, alienating people. And the Bible says we're supposed to be salt and light. We're supposed to show people how good God is, how bright our lives are, what God has done for us. So we should be full of joy. We should be full of peace. And the world looks at you in the midst of all your trials and adversity because our lives aren't perfect. And they say, man, I want what you have because I don't have that. Now, if we're just yelling at everybody and waving our fingers at everybody, they're going to be like, well, you're miserable too, so why would I do that? It's the Holy Spirit's job to bring conviction. And then he shows them sin, introduces them to God's righteousness and the coming judgment. I probably ought to get this right because there is a heaven to gain and a hell to pay. That's the Holy Spirit's job. That's what he's supposed to do. And so every single person on planet Earth has the with experience of the Holy Spirit. He's with everybody on planet earth, whispering. Some will respond and some will sear that conscience and they will not listen to the still small voice. Now, the second step of the Holy Spirit is what Jesus said. He is with you now, but later he will be in you. Jesus was prophetically speaking about salvation. So he's with you before salvation. If you wanna jot some extra notes, he's in you at salvation. So the disciples now, if you fast forward to John chapter 20, Jesus has given his life. He's actually been raised from the dead. He's already talked to Mary and nobody else believes her that he's alive. And so the disciples have locked their doors. They are completely panicking. They're totally freaking out. And Jesus, I don't know if you study this or if you find humor in the Bible, I think it's hilarious. Jesus just wanders around for like 120 days, freaking people out, just like walking through walls. And like, he, so he walks in and he's like, y'all got something to eat? Cause I'm hungry. And the Bible says they gave him some fish. And then he says to them in verse 21 of John chapter 20, y'all need to chill out. Peace be with you. I'm sure they're screaming. As the father has sent me, now I am sending you. And with that, 
He breathed on them, check it out, and said, receive the Holy Spirit. This is what he spoke about prophetically. He said, later, the Holy Spirit's going to be in you. So when he breathes on them in John chapter 20, they've now had a salvation experience because Jesus has been raised to life. He's paid the price for sin. Salvation is now available, and the disciples were the first to experience it. But it's fascinating to me. If that was all there is, then that would have been it. Jesus would have said, it's time to go preach the gospel. But that's not what he said. In Luke, in Luke chapter 24, the very same passage of scripture, very same story, he says, I am sending forth the promise of my father upon you, so stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. So every single person on planet earth has the with experience of the Holy Spirit. Every single believer on planet earth has the in experience of the Holy Spirit. But I'm here to tell you today that there's one more. There's an upon experience that Jesus talked about. You have to be clothed with power from on high. The upon experience is what I would like to call the power experience that Jesus was speaking about in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 where we started. You will, be, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. A very different Greek word that is not used in conjunction with salvation ever in Scripture. Because salvation is the inexperience of the Holy Spirit. This is the upon where the Holy Spirit, the pneuma of God, that blast of breath comes upon your life in what we call the third baptism experience. It immerses you in the power of the Holy Spirit and energizes, supercharges you to live right, to influence the world around you, to see signs and wonders, and to be the person that God has called you to be. And I'm telling you, you need the helper in that role. Like, I don't know how you would possibly live your life in these crazy times with everybody questioning everything that you do all the time. In a world that is fascinated with the supernatural and seeking after power, the church better have some. And the reason why we don't have the miracles of the book of Acts is because we don't have the theology of the book of Acts. If we would embrace what Jesus said, because I don't know where you land in your faith today, but we're not cessationists. We don't believe that Jesus did all that for one generation to see signs and wonders. We believe that miracles are for today. And if he's ever healed anybody ever, that he'll heal you, that his power is for today. And I, with my own eyes, and this is why the gospel is so important for you. God never intended to be studied. He intended to be experienced. So you can argue whatever you want from scripture, but I have laid hands on the sick and I have seen them recover. You cannot convince me that it's not for today. I have laid my hands on people foaming at the mouth and rolling around in the floor, losing their minds under the power of the devil and said, come out in the name of Jesus. And they wake up and go, where am I? What's going on? Because the power is real. But I'm just telling you, I don't know how you live this life without it. We're not here to just kumbaya kumbaya Jesus and kind of just make it to heaven and get our little fire insurance. No, we're called. I don't know about you, but I want to be so full of the Holy Spirit that every day I wake up, hell shudders and goes, my God, he's alive. He woke back up. He's he's out on the loose. We don't know where he's going. We don't know what he's going to do. We need to be agents of change, and we can't do that without the supercharger in life. He's the helper, verse 26 of John 14. So the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, that advocate is the word perikletos again. He will also teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. So not only is that our helper, number two, jot it down, he's also our teacher. Our teacher. And as our teacher, he provides us with beautiful, honest feedback about our lives. We talked about it at first Wednesday and even last weekend. When you read this book with the power of the Holy Spirit, it reads you. Remember last week we talked about how it judges our thoughts and our attitudes? Well, that's what the Holy Spirit does. He he takes the scripture, makes it come to life, and it becomes a mirror. And the Holy Spirit, through inner conviction, is this voice that speaks to us. And I love that. We need honest feedback. It's one of the things I actually love about this car. There's this whole 
program inside this car called Performance Pages. Coolest thing ever. You click on Performance Pages, and it's going to give you feedback about the car. It's going to tell you how many Gs you're pulling laterally. It's going to tell you how quickly you're braking. It's going to give you honest feedback how much horsepower you're using at the moment. As you, it doesn't give you all the horsepower all at once, but as you press on the gas, the horsepower tells you how much horsepower at that moment you're actually using from the engine. And then it's got this beautiful timer right there built into the dash, so you don't have to wonder how fast you're going zero to 60. It tells you how fast you just went zero to 60, how fast your fastest time was. It's fantastic, because you all remember junior high. Any athletes in the room remember junior high when you went and you were just balling out? You're pl- uh, like running track, you're playing ball, you're doing some football, you're making moves. You're like, Heisman, baby, that was sick. I remember in basketball, like, man, I was like, ooh, I cradled it. Like, I was probably in the air for like 12 seconds. That's Jordan stuff. Who says white man can't fly? <laughs> Your parents are there at the game. Y'all remember them big old camcorders on the shoulder? Your parents are like, <laughs> you go home, you put that VHS in, like, mom, you can't believe, watch this move. And then you watch it back, you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't even leave the ground. <laughs> they were right, white men can't jump, that's it. They were tr- it's true. I'm a scrub, it's terrible. Why? Because it's honest feedback. You don't have to wonder how fast you're going zero to 60, it'll tell you. You don't know how to drive this car. Because the manufacturer says it goes zero to 60 in 3.8 seconds. You can't get under five because you keep flying all over the place, fishtailing, slamming the gas. You don't know what you're doing. Performance pages give you the honest truth. That's what the Holy Spirit does about your spiritual life because every one of us can get in deception. And verse 13 of John 16, Jesus says he's the spirit of truth and he will guide you into all truth. Listen, in the world that we live in of disinformation, there's no way that you're gonna be able to live in the truth without the guidance of the Holy Spirit, without his leading in your life because the devil is so good at lying. We are so good at falling for deception and fooling ourselves. We've gotta have the Bible. We've gotta have the Holy Spirit. We've gotta have revelation. I'm telling you, I prayed the most sacrilegious prayer in the Philippines. I thought God would strike me dead because I felt called to preach and my cousin was making me preach and I'd never been to Bible college and I remember looking at my Bible, preparing for a message and I thought, I literally prayed this prayer to God. I have read this book my entire life to fall asleep. There's like four or five great stories in here, but if you're calling me to preach, that's like 52 weekends a year and we're gonna run out of content, you and me, real fast and it's gonna be real bad because this is pretty boring. And then I was like waiting for God to strike me dead. So I said, Holy Spirit, I need you to be my teacher. And I remember literally immediately after that prayer, I began to read the word in a way I'd never seen it before in my entire life. All of a sudden, words began to jump off the page and I saw application and I saw the Holy Spirit speaking to me in a way that I could speak to others. And I began to see outlines and stories and and it was so relevant, it was so alive and it's never stopped since that day. And I want that for you so bad, but you cannot have that without the teacher. You've got to have that honest feedback in your life. You need a helper. You need a teacher, a spirit-empowered, supercharged life. As we close, let's go to John 15 for just a moment. Verse 26, Jesus continues, when the advocate, speaking of the Paracletos, when he comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. Number three, you need to know As it pertains to your purpose in life, the Holy Spirit is the enabler. He's the one who equips and empowers you. Remember last weekend we talked about how we're called to be a light. The one thing we all have in common is that we would declare his praises, that we'd be a light for Jesus, that in every environment people would see a reflection of Christ. Well, the only way that you can do that with any kind of consistency, in my opinion, is through the power of the Holy Spirit. He's the one who makes you better than you are on your own. I like to say it often, and I heard it from my pastor, the Holy Spirit doesn't make me better than you, the Holy Spirit makes me better than me. 
I need his empowerment. I need his enabling to be the person God's called me to be. And that's, again, one of the things I love. Dodge has got it figured out. They've got all kinds of things like line lock. For those of you that don't like to race, you don't know what line lock is. But if you're ever going to drag race, you got to warm your tires up. And if you uh, don't have line lock, then you got to do this thing where you kind of ride the brake and then roll your tires at the same time. It kind of burns up the back brakes. Well, Dodge figured that out for you. You just push this button line lock it locks the front wheels and it unlocks the back wheels and you can just floor it all day long and burn up thousands of dollars of rubber as much as you want gets you ready to race then they have this little button called launch control and launch control is something that's always come on like lamborghinis and ferraris but now you can get it on american car and it's right there you don't even have to go through the dash Through the programming, there's a button right on the dash that says, I want to go to jail. (laughs) Launch control. So anybody pulls up next to you at any time, you're ready. In season and out of season, just like the Holy Spirit. I'm ready to testify the goodness of God right now. Launch control. And you have to you have to learn how to use it because what it does is it keeps you from just burning out. You get to set the level that the engine goes to. And then if you're not a fast driver, you don't know this little trick. We spend all of our lives telling you you can't drive with two feet. Like don't ever press the gas and the brake at the same time. Ever been taught that? Lie from the pit of hell. If you drive with one foot, you will lose every time. You have got to press the brake with your left foot and the gas with your right foot. And launch control is so amazing, it melts your brain because you press the gas and the brake at the same time as hard as you can. And then you let go of that brake and poof, it launches you. It's amazing. You can win every time. Lance don't have to be a good driver. He's always going to win because he's got launch control in his life. You don't have to be good at anything in life. When you got the Holy Spirit, he will empower you to be good, to be better than yourself every single moment. He'll give you the words to speak. He'll give you the anointing. He'll give you the favor. He'll give you the open door. It's a cheat code for life. You've got to have the enabler. Verse 26, he says he will testify about me listen to me church this is where we get off in the holy spirit message because the holy spirit and the anointing the power of god the baptism of the holy spirit it's not so we can have powerful church services it's not so that we can just kumbaya with jesus it's so that we can win a lost and dying world with the message of the gospel paul said i didn't come with wise and persuasive words but with a demonstration of the spirit's power so that your faith wouldn't rest on wisdom but on an experience with an encounter with God we have to be the carriers of that power it's what gives us the boldness to share Jesus with the world around us it's the fulfillment of the great commission I want you to know that we are a spirit filled tongue talking charismatic church but we are not doing it for our own feel good we are doing it because there are people in this community that are lost and they are broken and they are far from God and they are going to hell and they desperately need a church that can break the bondage that's on their life lead them to a place of freedom help them be restored and recovered and we cannot do it as a church without the power of the Holy Spirit. We need the anointing to do what the Lord has called us to do. And I'm thankful for the work of the Spirit. People say, well, churches like yours are seeker-friendly churches. They quench the Holy Spirit. Well, the Holy Spirit brings people to Christ and over 50,000 people have gotten saved in our church. So I would say the Holy Spirit is doing His job just fine, praise the Lord. Last weekend alone, 136 people made decisions for Christ because we put a car on the stage. We will do anything short of sin to win God's lost kids. That always has been and always will be our focus. We are passionately seeking after those that nobody wants, those that the world is told will never make it, those that religion has given up on. We say go to the highways and the byways and to compel them to come in because God wants his house to be full. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want you to live a spirit-empowered life. Jesus actually said it's better. It's better that I leave. It's better that the Holy Spirit comes. It's better. I wanna pray for you in just a minute to receive the power of the Holy Spirit, but first, 
I know that there's somebody here in one of our services at one of our campuses who's far from God today. I just want you to know that God loves you. And life doesn't make sense until you make your way back to your creator. There's been a fog over your mind that's tried to deceive you that this thing isn't worth it and that God's not real, that religion is empty. But today I want you to hear, this is not about religion, it's about relationship. There's a longing in all of our hearts to find purpose in this life. And the Bible says God put that there so that we would hopefully find our way back to him. Life really doesn't make sense until you surrender to your maker. And I'd love to help you do that today. You might be thinking, you don't understand. I'm so far from God and he could never love a person like me. Well, that's religion that tries to tell you those things. God's mad that God wants to judge you. No, the truth is God loves you and he sent Jesus to rescue you. He wants to do a miracle on the inside of your life today. He wants to come and live on the inside of you. And all you have to do is pray a very simple prayer of surrender that I'd love to help you with before we go. At every campus, nobody moving around, every head bowed, every eye closed. Maybe that's you today. There's no accidents. Don't let this moment pass you by. If you look back over your life, you'd recognize that the Holy Spirit has been leading you and convicting you and drawing you to prepare you for this moment. And now it's time. Tomorrow is promised to none of us. Don't leave here without being sure that Jesus is your Lord. I'm just going to pray a simple prayer with you. I'm not going to make you come down to the front. I'm not trying to single you out. Just right where you're at, connecting you to Jesus, if that's you. Would you just slip your hand up high? Come on, at every campus, just be bold for just a moment. Say, Dave, that's me. I need a fresh start. I need salvation. I need the Holy Spirit to come and live on the inside of me and make me brand new today. Come on, all over this place. Be bold. Lift your hands up high. This is your moment. Don't let it pass you by. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it's all about. It's amazing. You can put your hands down if you haven't already. Here's what we'll do. I'm going to lead you in this simple prayer. You can pray it quietly in your heart. You just need to mean it. Just say, Lord Jesus, I surrender to you today. I repent of all of my sin, and I give you control of my life. Rescue me. Change me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Help me live this life for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Now as we maintain an attitude of prayer before we go, I felt like the Lord wanted me to give you the opportunity to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit today. Doesn't have to be crazy or weird. The Bible does tell us that we can pray in a prayer language that we don't understand and that the devil doesn't understand. It's direct communication between you and the Lord. But he's going to fill you with gifts and empower you with boldness and change the trajectory of your life. It's a supercharged Christian life that God's calling us to. Maybe you say, Dave, I've never had that experience before, and I'd love to take another step with the Holy Spirit. I'd love to receive that prayer at every campus today. If that's you today, would you just be bold enough to lift your hand up high before we pray to let me know? Come on, all across the room, at every campus, out in additional seating, wherever you're at today, take just a moment to lift your hand up high. We're going to pray in just a minute, and God's power is going to touch your life. That's amazing, all across the room. All right, here's what I want you to do before we pray. Open your palms to heaven like you're going to receive. You need to be in a posture of receiving and just open your heart. Lord Jesus, we set aside our preconceived ideas and all of the false beliefs that we have been sold by religion about the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we surrender to who you are and to all that you have to bring. We pray that you would empower us to live the life that you've called us to live. 
Holy Spirit, I pray that you would completely immerse every single person under the sound of my voice today. Baptize them, God, with the power that you intended for us to have. We thank you that they will speak with new tongues. God, we thank you that in the name of Jesus, they'll see the power that you have given them, the boldness and the confidence that you will give them to live this life for you. God, I thank you that the trajectory of their life will forever be altered from this moment forward. Help them to receive all that you came to bring them. God, we thank you for a church that will walk in the confidence and the boldness with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We pray that we would experience all that you came to bring and that we would be the light that you've called us to be. God, we thank you that the Holy Spirit will testify about you. So as we go from this place, we thank you that we'll be salt and light to a world that is lost and broken. We thank you that we'll notice a boldness that we never had before, a confidence that we've never had before, that when we open our mouths, you'll give us the words to speak and that God, we will begin in a radical way to make a difference for you. We thank you for the opportunity to serve you and to love you. We pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. And all God's people said amen, amen. Come on, church, let's give God praise today for what God has done. Come on, give me your best. Thank you so much for joining iTown Church online today. We would love to have the chance to meet you and your family in person at one of our campuses. Or, of course, you can join us streaming live online this weekend. Now, for more details about times and locations and even some of our streaming options, you can go to itownchurch.com. I sure hope to see you soon, and God bless.